Okay, hello everyone. Thanks for being here today. My name is Sammy Herdman um, and Lindy, you can go to the next slide. Um, as these images show, I love trees, which is how I came to be a forest associate at Environment America. Specifically, I work on the campaign to protect the Canadian boreal forest, which I'm excited to talk about today. If you think of any questions during the presentation, then send them in the chat and Environment America intern Sydney Vallone will write them down and I'll answer them at the end. So for those of you who don't know, um, the boreal region stretches around the entire globe between 50 and 60 degrees north. It covers land in Alaska, Canada, Russia, China, Finland, Sweden, Norway, and Japan. Today I'll be talking exclusively about the North American boreal forest, unless I indicate otherwise. In North America, the boreal covers 1.5 billion acres, with 1.2 billion acres undisturbed by human industrial activities. It's the largest intact forest left on Earth. The boreal is made up of spruce, pines, firs, aspens, and more. It's also characterized by its incredible number of freshwater bodies and wetlands. It has some of the deepest freshwater lakes in the world and is the largest source of fresh water on Earth. Much of that fresh water is found in wetlands. You can go to the next slide, Lynn. Thank you. Um, wetlands are one of the most effective carbon storage ecosystems. In the Canadian boreal forest, the billions of acres of trees and plants absorb enough carbon dioxide to offset the emissions of 24 million passenger vehicles. Furthermore, that carbon is then kept out of the atmosphere, stored in the trunks, leaves, and roots of the trees. When the trees die, the, wetlands the wetland conditions prevent much of that carbon from escaping. Essentially, the carbon is trapped as peat and soil in the ground. The Canadian boreal forest is the Earth's largest terrestrial carbon storehouse, storing 208 billion tons of carbon, which is 11% of the world's total. On average, boreal forests store twice as much carbon per acre as tropical forests. It's impossible to overstate the importance of protecting the boreal forest and preventing the worst impacts of climate change. Next slide. With so much undisturbed forest, it is no wonder that the North American boreal forest is a bastion of biodiversity for many species who have lost a lot of their habitat further south. Mammals like caribou, moose, elk, wolves, wolverines, cougars, links in all three North American species of bear roam in the boreal region. Finally, the North American boreal forest is near and dear to many Americans' hearts because it is an immense breeding ground for billions of birds. Nearly half of all of the bird species found in North America breed in the boreal forest in the summer. Then three to five billion birds migrate south to spend their winters in our backyards and parks. Featured on this slide is a, the boreal chickadee, um, and the boreal chickadee spends its entire life cycle in the boreal forest. However, if you think of any bird you see near your home, um, there's a good chance that at least a portion of its population probably breeds in the boreal forest. So common loons, Canada geese, broad-winged hawks, mallard ducks, warblers, woodpeckers, flycatchers, blackbirds, sparrows. There's, I could go on. But I highly recommend looking at the Boreal Songbird Initiative website to learn more about the birds of the boreal and the link to that website will be sent in the chat. Um, so uh, next slide. The services provided by the boreal extend to more than just the animals that live there. The boreal provides many ecosystem services that can be quantified in terms of their economic value. Um, this includes water filtration, courtesy of the boreal's vast wetlands. The wetlands also lessen the effects of floods and droughts by storing and moderating the flow of water between upland areas and lowland regions. The trees and other vegetation help to control erosion, improving the cycling of nutrients and promote the formation of soil. The boreal forest is also linked to the heritage of many indigenous peoples. At least 70% of, of Canada's indigenous peoples, which is more than 600 communities, live in the boreal region and have done so for millennia. Some indigenous peoples, such as the Cree communities of Iu Isji and the Cree nation government, have led efforts to promote the sustainable management of the boreal region. Canada's boreal forest, and more broadly the boreal zone, is crucial to the national economy of Canada. Much of the world's forestry, mining, oil, and gas production, hydroelectric generation, tourism, and harvesting of natural products occur in the boreal forest. 
About 14% of Canadians living in hundreds of communities located in the boreal region rely on these industries. But what is the toll of these industrial activities? And is there a way to balance the extraction of natural resources with the preservation of the boreal's intact regions, wildlife, carbon storage potential, and the cultures of the communities that live there? Before we can answer these questions, it's important to understand the distinction between deforestation and forest degradation. This is a distinction that allows the Canadian government to market themselves as a world leader in sustainable forest management, despite being third in the world for forest loss. Deforestation occurs when forests are converted to non-forest uses. So when forests are cut down to make room for agriculture or road construction. Forest degradation occurs when forest ecosystems lose their capacity to provide important goods and services to people in nature. Essentially, if you clear cut a forest, which means you just cut down all the trees in an area and put a farm there, that counts as deforestation. If you clear cut a forest and just leave it as stumps, that counts as degradation. Because when the boreal forest is logged in Canada, the land is not converted to other land uses, but instead left to regenerate, it isn't technically deforestation. That's how Canada claims a deforestation rate of less than 1% per year, which you can see on the slide here in an excerpt from the Natural Resources Canada website. I've also included a screenshot from the Global Forest Watch website, an international nonprofit that shows that Canada is third in the world for forest loss. One million acres of forest are clear cut every year in the Canadian boreal. That's 1.5 football fields every single minute. Um, now I'm gonna play a clip from a webinar hosted by Environment America a few months ago, featuring Jennifer Skeen, the Natural Climate Solutions Policy Manager of the NRDC's International Program. She recently authored a report called Missing the Forest, How Carbon Loopholes for Logging Hinder Canada's Climate Leadership, which will be sent in the chat as well. Well, Canada, as we know, enjoys a, a global reputation, especially among Americans, of being an environmental leader, uh, in part because of obfuscation tactics that I'll discuss in a minute. Its logging industry is, in fact, systematically eroding uh, the boreal forest with little in the way of federal or provincial policies to mitigate these impacts, uh, or at least far, far too little uh, on the books. Each year, the logging industry actually clear cuts more than a million acres of boreal forest. And much of this is happening in never before logged primary forests. In fact, Canada has the third highest um, loss of intact forest landscapes in the world behind only Russia and Brazil. And you may actually be more familiar with the term old growth forest, especially if you've been following sort of the, the second war of the woods in British Columbia. Um, but since the terms uh, old growth and primary are a little bit distinct, I'll speak uh, in terms of primary forests, which just means that these are forests that have never before been industrially disturbed. Um, now, before we get into Canada's accounting uh, skullduggery, I want to focus a minute on primary forests. Um, and a big reason for that is because government and industry do not. Uh, you've, you've probably heard claims from companies, uh, whether it's Procter & Gamble, who, who Environment America spoke about earlier, or, or other um, sources of, of wood from the boreal, um, about how they replant the trees that they cut down. They say forests are renewable because trees can regrow. They also claim, you know, forests are all the same. Um, Canada, like most countries in the global north, insists that it has hardly any deforestation because while they clear cut their forests, the forest will eventually grow back. Um, and to them, a forest is a forest is a forest, whether it's hundreds of years old or as in the picture here, covered in stumps. And these are really criminally misleading statements um, because while trees may be replaceable, at least on a certain time scale, um, forests certainly are not. And in terms of primary forests, uh, time itself is actually an essential part of the ecosystem. Primary forests develop over centuries, requiring generations of ecosystem interactions and um, they're characterized by really complex dynamics that can only come really with 
with time, with the slow march of time. Uh, and companies, you know, for all their technological prowess and, and resources, cannot manufacture um, that, that time element. Great. So what are the resources available in such bounty in the boreal forest that the Canadian government is willing to allow the indiscriminate clear cutting of this priceless forest? According to the Natural Resources Canada website, in 2019, forest exports brought in a whopping $33.2 billion. Its key exports are wood pulp, specifically, oh, you can go to the next slide. Well, Canada. Um, oops. <laughs> wood pulp, specifically the highest quality wood pulp, which is um, North Bleached Softwood Craft Pulp, or NBSK. Um, Canada accounts for one third of world production of NBS cape wood pulp. This wood pulp is used to produce paper and tissue products. And if you haven't actively switched to a green brand, odds are that the toilet paper in your bathroom and the tissues on your bedside table are made of trees from the boreal forest. It is perhaps one of the most ludicrous and wasteful practices of the modern age. The fact that we convert um, decades old carbon absorbing trees into products that are used for just seconds before being flushed away. Newsprint is another major export. Canada is the single largest producer of newsprint in the world. Demand has been falling though, now that print media is being replaced by electronic media. And softwood lumber. Canada is one of the world's largest producers and exporters of softwood lumber, um, which accounts for 20% of the value of Canada's forest product exports. And where do these products go? According to Natural Resources Canada, the U.S. remains the most important market for Canada's forest sector. In 2019, over two-thirds of Canadian forest products are, were exported. And the United States accounted for about 68% of Canada's total forest product exports. Next slide. So as I mentioned before, the logging industry in the North American boreal forest isn't technically deforesting the land. It's degrading it. However, the important place, the import placed on that distinction by the Canadian government and by the American companies that source wood products from the boreal is very misleading. It's a technical distinction that obfuscates the true cost of logging in the boreal. One of the greatest impacts is on our climate. By disturbing the carbon rich soil and removing the carbon absorbing trees, degrading the boreal adds 26 million metric tons of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere on average every year, which is the emissions equivalent of the carbon pollution from 24 coal-fired power plants um, annually. Despite the common misperception that the carbon released from degraded areas, areas can be counteracted by planting new trees, it is far more carbon efficient to simply allow existing forests to remain standing. In fact, forests that are cut down often emit more carbon than they capture for more than 10 years. And replanting doesn't make up for this carbon loss because individual trees have a slower carbon absorption rate when they're younger. Next slide. Intact forests or forests that haven't been logged or impacted by industry, which in the video gen scheme also called primary forests, um, host greater levels of biodiversity than previously logged forests. When forests are logged in Canada, 90% of the time they're clear cut. Not shockingly, turning a forest into a barren landscape of stumps doesn't do much to foster the ecosystem. And what is especially unfortunate is that some of that degraded land will never grow back. A study that evaluated 27 logged forest sites in Ontario found that 14% um, of the area was still barren up to three decades later. These barren areas, called logging scars, are caused by logging roads in areas where equipment and log trees are stacked, compacting the earth and making growth difficult. Logging impacts organisms throughout the food chain. Mosses, liverworts, and lichens are destroyed when trees are logged, and many rely on dead trees to grow, which are not as present in logged areas. Lichens are vital food for woodland caribou during the winter. Many other invertebrates like beetles rely upon dead and decaying trees for food. Although the abundance of birds in the Canadian boreal has not yet been significantly impacted that we know, the species composition may be. For example, in Ontario, Canada, for up to 50 years after logging took place, the songbird communities in logged forests differed from the communities in intact forests. 
This is because some species prefer intact forests or avoid areas where the forest is broken up into fragments. Many mammals also prefer unlogged intact forests. One study found that for 50 to 60 years after being logged, forests provided less suitable habitat for martens, red-backed voles, heather voles, red squirrels, northern flying squirrels, short-tailed shrews, and star-nosed moles. Woodland caribou, perhaps one of the most iconic species of Canada, used to range over half of the country. Now they rely on the intact regions of the boreal forest. They avoid areas disturbed by industrial activities. This presents an existential threat to the species, as much of their current range overlaps with areas leased for logging. The species is threatened and their survival depends on preserving intact portions of the boreal forest. Next slide. Deforestation comes with quantifiable costs. It increases instances of erosion and water pollution, which can lead to infrastructure damages from mudslides and impaired flood buffers, cutbacks in hydropower productivity, unhealthy fish stocks, and reduced tourism profits. Low-income communities are likely to suffer the most from the costs of, costs of deforestation, especially if they don't have the means to replace the services and goods that the forests provide them for free. In addition to providing sustenance, Many forests are held sacred and intertwined with the cultures of the people that live in and near them, some of which have been tied to the forest for centuries. Next slide. This all seems very bad. The forest is important, but it's being clear cut and the Canadian government is not stepping up to protect it. Fortunately, there are solutions out there and Environment America is pursuing several of them. The gist of all of the solutions is that instead of clear cutting the boreal to extract as many resources as we possibly can at whatever cost, let's use alternatives to new wood where we can and manage the forests in a sustainable manner where we cannot. Let's try to protect the remaining intact forests because they are so important to carbon storage and biodiversity. Substitutes for freshly felled wood and wood products um, include recycled products and alternative materials. Recycled products are the most sustainable option because they reduce pressure on forests by not requiring more trees to be cut down. And they also lengthen the life cycle of old wood products, keeping them out of the landfill for longer. The landfill is where old products decay and release the carbon that they, store, that they were storing back into the atmosphere. So using recycled products delays carbon emissions. Um, two great examples of recycled products include tissue products made from recycled materials. If you check out the issue with tissue scorecard released by the NRDC each year, which is on the slide here, you can see what brands of tissue products opt to use recycled paper and other materials to make toilet paper and tissues instead of using freshly felled trees. I saw that someone in the chat mentioned that they use the brand Who Gives a Crap 100% recycled paper, um, and that is a great option. Reclaimed wood um, is another way to reduce um, the pressure on forests. This is wood salvaged from old barns, furniture, gym floors, or other places. Unfortunately, reclaimed lumber is often more expensive than traditional lumber because it takes longer to produce than freshly filled wood, and the supply is less consistent. So while it isn't always preferable for large-scale construction, it's a great option for artisan and DIY projects. You can find reclaimed wood at Home Depot, Etsy, or eBay. Next slide. Alternative materials are very promising where recycled goods are not an option. The most common is bamboo. There are tons of bamboo products on the market. Bamboo toothbrushes, bamboo paper towels, bamboo lumber that can be used in construction projects. There are several reasons why bamboo is so sustainable compared to wood. One is that it grows very rapidly. So it can be harvested three to four years after planting and annually thereafter, which is much faster than wood. Also, it can be grown on wasteland or unused riverbanks, allowing it to mitigate flooding potential and absorb carbon from the atmosphere. It's important, however, to make sure that the bamboo products you purchase are Forest Stewardship Council certified, um, which I'll be calling FSC for short. Um, if they're not FSC certified, then forests may have been cut down to make room for bamboo, bamboo plantations. There are also dozens of other alternatives to wood-derived products. Wheat straw, a residue of wheat farming, can be collected and turned into tissue products rather than being burned or disposed of in landfills. Rather than building with lumber, innovators are creating novel construction materials like bricks made of post-consumer recycled plastics. 
Hempcrete, another possible replacement for lumber, is a construction material made from hemp plants. While these products are limited in availability, they all reduce pressure on forest resources and demonstrate that innovation can overcome our perceived reliance on wood. Next slide. While we would like to decrease our dependence on wood products where possible, um, some projects just need new wood. In those scenarios, we would like to see wood harvested in a manner that protects the carbon rich and biodiverse ecosystems in the boreal and also respects the land ownership of indigenous peoples. The only way consumers can know that their wood was harvested responsibly is if it was certified by a legitimate third party. The only third party certification that is truly effective in Canada and much of the world is the Forest Stewardship Council, which I mentioned before, um, FSC. FSC is endorsed by organizations like the Natural Resources Defense Council, the National Wildlife Federation, Greenpeace, and many more. Peer reviewed studies have determined that FSC provides the most prescriptive and extensive environmental protection for forests in comparison to other certification systems. That does not mean that FSC is perfect. For example, the efficacy of FSC varies depending on the country the wood is coming from, but from the North American boreal forests, FSC is the best option. There are 10 guiding principles that each forest certified by FSC needs to uphold. I'm not gonna go over them all in detail, but um, I'd like to highlight a few. So all organizations certified by FSC must uphold the legal and customary land rights of indigenous peoples. Third parties that would like to manage indigenous people's lands must first obtain their free prior and informed consent. Um, they must also maintain and restore ecosystem services and avoid damaging the environment, including the preservation of biodiversity, natural forests and rare or threatened species and they must maintain or enhance the site's high conservation values. These values include biodiversity, threatened habitats, ecosystems, ecosystem services, and the ability of the site to sustain local communities. Next slide. As demand increases for recycled wood products, alternatives to wood products and FSC certified wood, they will become more widely available. Companies will see the value in investing in these products and supply lines will open up. Everyone here can help the boreal forest by buying these products. If you'd like to help, um, consider taking our new pledge to protect our forests. We're asking our members to pledge to purchase sustainably produced tissue products, reclaimed wood or FSC certified products. The link is in the chat. Um, however, at Environment America, we also believe that the onus for sustaining our natural resources, protecting our climate, preserving biodiversity and maintaining the health and culture of local communities should fall upon governments and corporations, not just on the shoulders of consumers. Next slide. Um, we have several strategies for getting there. The first is legislation. While Environment America cannot lobby the Canadian government, we can introduce and support bills that regulate the importation of wood products and other forest risk commodities um, into the US. Forest risk commodities are commodities that are often produced at the expense of forests. So for example, beef, soy, and palm oil are often produced on lands where tropical forests were cut down. The production of those goods drives deforestation, so they are called forest risk commodities. Wood pulp and lumber are the major forest risk commodities from the boreal forest. The forest bill was introduced by Senator Schatz from Hawaii and Representative Blumenauer from Oregon. It stands for the Fostering Overseas Rule of Law in Environmentally Sound Trade Act of 2021, which is a mouthful, um, hence why we call it the Forest Act. And it would prohibit the importation of any commodities produced on land that was deforested illegally. The Forest Act could promote better oversight of protected forests in other countries and also greater supply chain traceability. There's also a state bill currently in New York Senate and a sim similar bill was introduced in, and vetoed in California, but will be introduced again with amendments. Um, they're called the deforestation free procurement bills. These bills require state contractors um, that sell forest risk commodities to the state to certify that the products did not originate on land where tropical or boreal forest degradation or deforestation occurred. Um, the deforestation free procurement bills are really promising because they can be adapted to different levels of government um, on a state level, a county level, a city level, or even something smaller. The deforestation free procurement bills leverage the greater buying power of institutions. So it's as if 
um, an entire state took the pledge that we showed before. If you know anyone on your local town council, then it may be worth mentioning this idea to them and you can direct them to Environment America if they have, if they have any interest. Next slide. The second strategy we have is to encourage companies to develop stringent procurement policies. At Environment America, we talk with company executives, educate consumers and organize consumers to put pressure on companies so that they're incentivized to change their wood procurement policies. A notable example is our ongoing campaign against Procter & Gamble, the producer of Charmin toilet paper and Bounty to paper towels. While they remain firmly entrenched in their belief that um, they have to use freshly filled trees because American consumers need the softest tissue products humanly possible, um, they have accelerated their commitments to start sourcing more FSC certified wood pulp from the boreal. So that's progress. We also recently started communicating with executives at Home Depot and Lowe's. Both companies import a lot of wood to the US from the boreal forest. Neither of them source much FSC certified wood. Lowe's seems to be willing to try to get there and we aren't so sure about Home Depot. Next slide. That brings us to our ask of you today. We've sent in the chat a petition or we're about to send in the chat a petition to the Home Depot CEO asking him to implement forest friendly policies. We'd appreciate your signature. Um, we also appreciate your attendance today. Thank you. And we have some time for questions. Hi, all right, so the first question for you, Sammy, is just to make sure you will be sending the slides and the links um, to the participants today. Yeah, the entire presentation is being recorded and we're gonna send it to um, everyone who RSVP'd with a list of all the links that we sent in the chat. Perfect. Um, okay, so we have another question here. So is, it, is there a better way to harvest trees than clear cutting? And would thinning forests be a better alternative to this? Yes, there is definitely um, more sustainable management that can be done. Um, so sustainable logging would preserve the qualities of the forest that make them really valuable to biodiversity and people and the climate. Um, so rather than clear cutting, Responsible forest managers could cut some trees, but not all, leaving um, important old trees, for example, so that there is a variation of ages in the forest. Um, and also sustainable logging would take into account that intact forests are valuable to biodiversity, um, so they would prevent fragmenting forests where possible. Um, there's a lot of forests that are sustainably managed out there, um, but we just need to normalize it. Did you see my response to that question? One, two down, about one form of that. So it seems like Mark has responded that thinning forests um, that are growing up works. It's called harvesting. Um, and so the new trees of a particular common species grow up faster. Yeah, and so what what they call that the dog hair thicket, where the new trees coming up are all one species, and you leave a few and those you harvest the rest, you leave a few, and then those grow up much faster. Thank you. So that's one method that works. Thank you. Um, we have another question here that says, why does the North American boreal forest sequester more carbon than the Amazon? There's a lot of um, different factors that go into that, but I think the primary one is that it has such wetland conditions. So it's very cold um, and when trees die or vegetation dies, instead of decomposing really quickly because it's warm, um, which decomposing releases carbon and back into the atmosphere, it's actually trapped in the wetlands and turns into what's called peat, which is just really carbon rich soil. Um, and so that peat is then stored there for a long, long time because it's so cold and not decomposing. Great. Um, also, we saw that bamboo um, was an alternative, but we saw that also um, in one of the scoring systems that bamboo toilet paper for why give, why give a crap was rated a D. So, so we had some questions as to how FSC was certified and how come these some of the bamboo products are not as rated as high. 
Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, it goes back to how the pam bamboo plantations are developed. So um, there are some bamboo plantations that are made on deforested land. So they cut down the trees and grow bamboo there, which obviously wouldn't uh, be good for the forest at all. So if um, bamboo plantations are grown in areas that did not previously have forests, that's very sustainable. If they're replacing really biodiverse ecosystems that had a lot of carbon storage potential, those are going to be really have a really low rating. Great. Um, we have some, some bamboo species are invasives and some are not. So always pay attention to which species you're dealing with. Great. We have another question here about what is the Canadian government doing? Um, so the Canadian government is doing a few things that are good. They've made a commitment to plant net 2 billion trees in the next decade. And they've also pledged to protect 30% of Canada's lands by 2030. Um, but when it comes to their carbon emission reduction goals, they actually have a lot of exceptions and loopholes for the logging industry. Um, and there are lots of groups in Canada that are organizing and putting pressure on the government, trying to push them to protect their forests. Um, but our campaigns using market pressure to impact the logging industry um, complement that work instead of directly affecting the Canadian government. And going off of that, how can we convince companies to change their wood policies? Um, well, our method is we start by working with the companies. So asking them to improve their policies, um, listening to the challenges that they might face in doing so. Um, and then the companies that are interested in working with us, then we, uh, we act as a resource to them and also hold them accountable to meet their goals. Um, if a company seems recalcitrant or if they ignore our meeting requests, then that's when we would leverage our experience with grassroots organizing. We have members all over the nation and student chapters on hundreds of campuses that we would then uh, mobilize to get petitions signed and send letters to the editors and um, call company headquarters and a lot more. Great, and the question in the chat going off the Canada question, is the Canadian government starting to limit loggers from clear cutting? Um, I don't think, there's definitely pressure from within Canada from some sides that want to make positive changes in the forestry sector, but right now there isn't um, anything super promising, it seems. Right now, 90% of the logging in Canada is clear cutting. Got it, interesting. So how do wildfires play into this? Um, so wildfires are definitely a really big concern in forests all over the world, but even when forest loss from wildfires are removed from the calculation in Canada, um, Canada is still third in the world for intact forest loss after Russia and Brazil. Um, and 60% of the forest loss in Canada is on land leased for logging. Um, and wildfires are actually, um, forests are more susceptible to really high intensity and damaging wildfires if they're logged unsustainably. Um, there's a lot of studies coming out. There's even an article in the Hill today talking about how the best way to protect our forests from wildfires is to manage them sustainably, not clear cut. Interesting. Um, we have a question in the chat. Um, do you know if there is any economic reason or supply reason for not making uh, this a policy for forms of tissue paper um, to be part of, to have regulations on these forms of tissue papers? Um, why there's in the US? I'm assuming, yeah. Um, I think because, I mean, I don't know the exact answer, but there's a lot of pushback from the big companies that are providing these tissue papers. Um, the obstacles that they're citing have to do with supply lines. They're saying they don't have enough um, recycled product that they can turn into a toilet paper or they don't have any bamboo plantations that they can quickly um, switch to. So um, it's definitely gonna be a slower transition, I think for these large companies like Procter & Gamble to switch to more sustainable and alternative materials. Um, it's definitely possible, but 
um, as of right now, they're just very powerful and have a really strong presence in our government as well. Great. All right, I think we have time for one more question um, and it's gonna come from the chat. Um, so to what extent do Canadian Forest Services co cooperate with the US Forestry Service to address this issue? Um, I actually am not sure about that. I think that there is definitely some trade organizations where I think there's cooperation between US and Canadian Forest Service, um, but I, I don't know to what extent. I also, I saw another question in the chat. It's what's the sustainable forestry initiative and how does it differ from the FSC? And that's a really great question. The sustainable forestry initiative is another certification. It is um, popular in Canada. I think it actually maybe certifies a little bit more land than FSC does. Um, and although they, if you go to their website, it seems really similar to FSC. If you dig into the policies a little bit, it actually has far less extensive coverage of forests. Um, there is a lot of records of um, organizations, environmental organizations, calling SFI out, Sustainable Forestry Initiative, for just providing an opportunity for companies to greenwash. Um, and like I said before, FSC is not perfect, but it is the best in Canada, and it was developed by NGOs and environmental organizations working with the logging industry, whereas SFI, the Sustainable Forestry Initiative, was initiated by the logging industry solely. Um, and I will send more information about the difference between SFI and FSC in the follow-up email, if anyone's curious. I also am seeing a lot um, of comments in the chat about bidets. And I would like to uh, just call out that those are a great option, paperless completely. So for those of you hesitant to try bamboo or recycled paper, then uh, you might wanna try a bidet. Um, and I think that's just about all the time we have. Um, so thank you everyone for being here and for all of your questions and engaging in the chat, we really appreciate it. Um, we're gonna send out a follow-up email with a recording of this webinar, as well as all of the links that we've sent and some follow-up information. Thank you.